In this presentation, a biplanar open wedge osteotomy of the proximal tibia will be planned and executed. The osteotomy will then be fixed with the Tomofix medial high tibia or MHT plate. Following the completion of this exercise, you should understand the clinical indications and contraindications, the patient position, the surgical approach, the technique for the biplanar open wedge osteotomy of the proximal tibia, and fixation of the osteotomy with the Tomofix MHT plate. An open wedge osteotomy of the medial proximal tibia is indicated for unicompartmental medial gonarthrosis with varus malalignment of the proximal tibia and idiopathic or post-traumatic varus deformity of the proximal tibia. Contraindications include inflammatory arthritis. The patient is positioned supine so that the hip, knee, and ankle joint can be visualized with the image intensifier. A lateral support and foot pad are attached to the operating table so that the leg can easily be positioned in 90 degrees of flexion and in full extension. The contralateral leg is lowered at the hip joint to facilitate access to the medial proximal tibia. The sterile draping also exposes the iliac crest so that the leg axis can be checked intraoperatively. A sterile tourniquet may be used. The knee is positioned in a 90-degree flexed position. The anatomic landmarks, which include the medial joint line, the cranial border of pes anserinus, the course of the medial collateral ligament, and the tibial tuberosity, are marked on the skin. The incision runs from a point anterior to the insertion of the pes, runs 6 to 8 centimeters in a posterocranial direction, and ends over the posteromedial corner of the medial tibial plateau in line with the skin lines and the saphenous nerve. The leg is positioned in full extension and the knee joint is adjusted into an exact AP view under fluoroscopic control. The medial and lateral compartments are aligned in the AP projection. The leg is rotated into a position that locates the patella exactly anteriorly, which usually results in one-third of the fibular head being covered by the tibia. A correct view of the tibia is crucial to ensure the proper orientation of the osteotomy. Two 2.5 mm K-wires are placed into the tibial head under image intensification to mark the direction of the osteotomy. The wires must run parallel and are aimed towards the previously defined hinge point. When the two wires are placed, it is important to ensure that there is sufficient space cranial to the saw cut for the four locking screws in the head of the Tomofix plate, leaving at least 30 millimeters to the ridge of the medial tibial plateau. The first K-wire is inserted proximal to the cranial border of the pes anserinus. The wires must be inserted exactly to the depth of the lateral tibial cortex. The second wire is placed posterior and parallel to the first wire. To maintain the inclination of the tibial slope, the wires must run at the same angle towards the tibial plateau. To ensure good bony contact in the area of the ascending cut after opening the osteotomy, the ascending osteotomy cut is made parallel to the anterior cortex of the tibial shaft at an angle of around 110 degrees to the transverse osteotomy cut. The cutting depth can be determined by holding a third K-wire of the same length against the near cortex and measuring the excess length in comparison to the previously inserted K-wires. In general, the diameter of the tibia will measure 5 to 10 millimeters smaller anteriorly than posteriorly. The cutting depth that was measured previously is marked on the saw blade. The transverse osteotomy is made with an oscillating saw below distal to the two K-wires that serve as a cutting guide. Special attention is given to completing the osteotomy cut within the hard posteromedial cortex of the tibia. The anatomical structures dorsal to the posterior tibial surface are protected with a Hohmann retractor. 
The entire sawing procedure is performed slowly with minimal pressure and constant irrigation to cool the saw blade. Once the oblique transverse cut has been made in the posterior part of the tibia, the ascending tibial tuberosity cut is made in the anterior part of the tibia with the thinner saw blade. The ascending cut is a complete cut, which includes the medial, superior, and lateral aspects of the tuberosity. In the patient, special care is taken to protect the patellar tendon while making the ascending tuberosity osteotomy. After the osteotomy cuts have been made, a ruler can be used to measure and verify that the osteotomy was completed as planned. To stiffen the proximal segment and help prevent fracturing of the articular surface of the tibia, the two guide wires are retained in the bone while the osteotomy is opened and spread. Light hammer blows are used to insert an osteotomy chisel into the transverse osteotomy to the depth of the lateral bony hinge, so that the insertion depth corresponds with the cutting depth. A second osteotomy chisel is slowly inserted to a depth of 10 millimeters less than the first. In order to prevent fracturing of the lateral cortex, the osteotomy is opened and spread slowly over a period of several minutes. Intraarticular secondary fractures can occur if the osteotomy is spread too quickly. Because of the medial collateral ligament complex, the osteotomy tends to open more anteriorly as it is spread, which causes the caudal inclination of the tibial plateau to increase. Therefore, it is important to ensure that the long superficial fibers of the medial collateral ligament have been released sufficiently and that the horizontal cut slides symmetrically. Additional chisels may be inserted to gradually spread the osteotomy until the desired opening angle has been reached. Each additional chisel is inserted to a depth slightly less than its predecessor. The chisels are removed. The Tomofix bone spreader is the second step in the opening of the osteotomy gap and plastic deformation of the lateral cortical hinge point. To do this, the chisels are removed and the Tomofix bone spreader is carefully hammered into the osteotomy until it reaches the hinge. To avoid any inaccuracies, the spreader must be inserted absolutely perpendicular to the lateral bony hinge. The osteotomy depth can be read from the scale on the spreader blades. The osteotomy is spread by slowly turning the screw clockwise with a screwdriver until the desired opening angle has been reached. If the tip of the tool is not precisely located at the hinge point, the readings on the bone spreader may not reflect the exact opening angle. After the Tomofix bone spreader has been removed, the bone spreader forceps is the final step in opening the osteotomy gap to a base length corresponding with the preoperative planning. The bone spreader forceps is inserted into the dorsomedial intercortical portion of the osteotomy gap. The osteotomy is spread slowly by opening the bone spreader forceps until the intended opening has been reached. The guide wires are carefully removed.
Preparation of the implant starts with the insertion of two spacers positioned in holes 4 and D. These spacers prevent periosteum compression by the plate during later plate tensioning and screw fixation. The guiding block is used to align the drill sleeves on the proximal part of the plate. The drill sleeves are inserted. and the guiding block is removed. The plate is inserted subcutaneously. The shaft portion must be aligned with the tibial diaphysis, avoiding anterior or posterior cortical overhang. The plate is positioned using image intensification to ensure that the solid plate segment bridges the osteotomy and that the proximal locking screws are located one centimeter subchondral to the joint line. A centering sleeve is inserted into the drill sleeve in hole B, and a K-wire is used to temporarily secure the plate. The hole for the first proximal self-tapping locking head screw is drilled using the 4.3 mm LCP drill bit inserted through the drill sleeve in hole A. The screw length is determined either by reading the drill depth from the mark on the drill bit or by measuring with the depth gauge after the drill sleeve has been removed. The screws should be as long as possible without protruding from the lateral cortical bone. Care is taken not to rotate the plate as the drill sleeves are unthreaded. The screw is inserted into hole A using a power tool, but not fully tightened. The screw is locked manually using the torque limiter. Optimum torque has been reached once the first click is heard and felt. The same procedure is followed to insert a self-tapping locking head screw in hole C. The K-wire and centering sleeve are then removed from hole B and a self-tapping locking head screw is inserted using the same procedure. A temporary lag screw is inserted into the first plate hole distal to the osteotomy, hole 1, in the neutral position of the dynamic part of the LCP hole. This lag screw, which is inserted intentionally at an angle and not perpendicular to the plate to create a force vector which compresses the lateral hinge by pulling the distal osteotomy segment towards the plate and also by forcing the plate into suspension, creating an elastic preload which will impose pressure upon the lateral hinge. Potential fissures within the lateral bone hinge are brought under elastic preload and distraction on the lateral side is eliminated. The hole is drilled with the 3.2 mm drill bit through the universal drill guide. The hole for the cortex screw is angled slightly towards distal to create the force vector compression of the hinge and also to ensure it will not interfere with the trajectory of the hole for the bicortical locking screw that will be inserted into the locking position of this hole. The screw length is determined with the depth gauge. A self-tapping cortex screw is inserted using a power tool, but not fully tightened.
Special care is taken when tightening the cortex screw to avoid stripping the thread and any associated damage to the bone. The screw is final tightened manually with a screwdriver. The osteotomy gap is checked constantly while the lag screw is slowly tightened to avoid secondary loss of correction. A stab incision is made over hole 3. This incision will be used to gain access to holes 2, 3, and 4. A monocortical hole is drilled with the LCP Universal Drill Guide through the locking portion of hole 2. A monocortical self-drilling locking screw is inserted using a power tool, but not fully tightened. The screw is final tightened manually using a screwdriver and torque limiter. Following the same procedure, a monocortical locking screw is inserted in hole 3. The 5.0 mm LCP spacer is removed from hole 4. A monocortical self-drilling locking screw is inserted using the same procedure. The lag screw is removed from hole 1. The LCP drill sleeve is threaded into plate hole 1. A bicortical hole is drilled with the 4.3 mm LCP drill bed. The screw length is determined from the scale on the drill bed. The drill sleeve is removed. A self-tapping bicortical locking screw is inserted using a power tool, but not fully tightened. The screw is locked manually using a screwdriver with a torque limiter. The 5.0 mm LCP spacer is removed from hole D. The locking screw is inserted. The final correction and position of the implant is confirmed with the image intensifier. You should now understand the clinical indications and contraindications, the patient position, the surgical approach, the technique for the biplanar open wedge osteotomy of the proximal tibia, and fixation of the osteotomy with the Tomofix MHT plate.